Greetings and welcome back to room 303. We turn now in senior English to page 523 and the Milton poem, Sonnet 19, sometimes, consider, uh, sometimes called um, On His Blindness or When I Consider How My Light Is Spent. So Milton, when he's young, writes Sonnet 7, How Soon Hath Time, at the age of 23 going on 24. And he chastises himself, as we've already talked about for not yet producing anything of great merit. And then, all of a sudden, he finds that he's beginning to lose his sight. Now there's a, a real argument by historians as to why Milton lost his sight. Some say it was just a genetic deficiency and it happens. Others said he spent six years sitting in his father's library and other libraries reading every known book he could find in all the languages that he knew for six years. We're talking about wake up in the morning, the minute you wake up, you sit down, you read until you go to bed at night and you're reading by candlelight the whole time, right? And over six years, he basically destroyed his eyesight. This argument is as well prevalent. Of course, the challenge is we've already captured a little bit of Milton's mentality of I've got talent and God expects me to use that talent. Oh, no, I'm not using that talent. And then he sits down to write this poem. Let's read it. I'm with you on 523. Again, I challenge you. Read a poem like this on your own with me. Don't just listen to me read it to you. See how well you can follow the language of this poem and understand it on your own. Take a look. When I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve there with my maker and present my true account, lest he returning chide, doth God exact day labor light denied? I fondly ask, but patience to prevent that murmur soon replies. God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. Now, we've already mentioned in a prior lecture on Sonnet 7 what your footnote now will tell you for your notes that you will write down at 3a. There it is. This word talent in line 3 is an allusion, a reference to the parable of the talents. I mentioned it already. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Matthew is the first of the four Gospels. Um, earlier, we were working with the King James Version of the Bible in a passage out of Luke, for example. Um, we spent a little bit of time with the Matthew Gospel in the Sermon on the Mount. Here, you have another parable. And again, this story, as your footnote will tell you, the servant who earns interest for his master on five talents a large unit of money is condemned. The servant who hides is commended. The servant who hides and then returns a talent is condemned to, quote unquote, outer darkness, right? In other words, God expects anyone with talent, and by the way, for Milton, he recognizes early on, I have prodigious talent, that God is going to expect more of him. To whom much is given, what's the famous line? Much is required, right? In other words, the responsibilities are greater, Milton believes, because he has more talent. He recognizes this early on. And yet, notice opening line. When I consider how my light is spent, right? In other words, there's multiple readings of this. One way to read this is, my light is spent means I'm getting older and... My candle, this is the word picture, my candle of my life is going down, 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 right? Another reading of this, which of course works very well because Milton begins to go blind, right? Light is spent, meaning I'm not able to see anymore. Notice he says, in this dark world and wide, and then that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless. Let's write it in our notes. This is amazing. We will see the same sentiment when we study some of the sonnets of Shakespeare. Milton thinks he's a looser. Milton thinks he has not accomplished anything. It is a mind-blowing thing to imagine that someone with such talent would think of himself as a 
looser. Why? I haven't, he would say, I haven't done anything that rivals Homer or Virgil, the greatest writers, of course, of the classical era. Oh, notice he imagines that the, did you see it capitalized at line five? The maker will return. And then line six, last word, chide. Chide here means to command in a negative way. Chide here means to demand. What is going on? He imagines God coming back and saying to him, doth God exact day labor light denied? In other words, what? You're blind? What, do I care about that? I don't care about that. That you're blind? What do I care that you're blind? I demand that you use your talents even if you're blind. Whoa. Whoa. Notice he then will turn in the second part of the poem. And again, at 2B, you can already see these Miltonic sonnets have this natural break where in the opening lines, a certain kind of problem or question is going to be raised, and then he's going to try to address it in some way. Notice the word patience is capitalized. Did you see this on line, in line 8? Patience to prevent that murmur replies. And notice the rest of the poem is in quotation marks. Do you see it? At the very end of the poem, do you see the quotation mark? The quotation mark actually begins then at line 9. Patience is personified and now is speaking to Milton. And what is it that Patience says? Let's get it in our notes at level one. What is it that Patience says to Milton? Milton has said out loud, my greatest horror is that God comes back and demands of me something and I haven't done anything. And when I use my blindness as an excuse, God's going to say, that is no excuse. You have talent. You should be able to produce even if you're blind. Again, the irony will be, Milton does produce even though he's blind and he writes the greatest poem in the English language, Paradise Lost. That we'll get to in a little while. Let's take a look at what Patience, however, says to Milton. Milton is actually doing a form of self-therapy here. Let's write this down. That's really what's going on. Milton is going to invent what Patience would say to him. And Patience says the following. Line 9, read it with me. God doth not need either man's works or his gifts. In other words, an all-powerful, omnipotent God does not need human action. In other words, this sounds very similar to much of what Calvin and Luther would both say at the great Protestant reformers, God does not need humans' actions. God wants humans to produce, of course, but God does not need that. Notice the next one. Who best bear his mild yoke? They serve him best. In other words, the idea is, Patience is saying to Milton, whatever happens, you have to have the ability and the patience. Well, we can jump to 3A really quickly. Remember those final lines from Longfellow's Psalm of Life. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still learning to labor and to wait. That labor and to wait thing is the same project we're seeing here, right? Notice, his state is kingly. In other words, notice you have the opposite side of this driven, driven, driven thing. You have to be patient. You have to wait. It takes a long time to be able to become the success you wish yourself to be. Notice, thousands at his bidding speed here. Thousands of angels, that is to say, at his bidding speed. And post or travel or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand. And wait. Now, this is an interesting poem because what Milton says is even though I have talent and even though I'm very driven, I have to have patience. I have to wait. In other words, let's put it in our notes at level one and maybe even 2A is a possible message. My time will come. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of patience. It's a matter of time. In other words, it's a two-part dance, and it's somewhat spiritual schizophrenia. Let's say it out loud, right? On the one hand, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. I got all this talent. I got to do something. I got to do something. I got to do something. But at the same time, he's telling himself, I have to be patient. I have to wait, right? Longfellow saying it again, right? We've got to learn to labor, and we've got to learn to wait. That two-part dance. Well, obviously, at 2A, let's write it down. Possible messages and themes here. 
you can, you can write down, obviously, several of your own, right? Uh, that capacity to be driven. I got to produce. But as well, I have to have the patience to wait. Things come in their appointed time. I can believe that God demands of me, Milton will tell himself, but I can also believe that it's going to take time. But the one thing we will say definitely is God accepts no excuses in Milton's poem. No excuses, not even blindness. Wow. Now, when we get later down at level three, we'll ask some questions about, are we familiar with this argument at all and how this argument either works for us and resonates for us or it does not? Of course, it to be no question. Notice again, this is a sonnet. We have the we have definitely the iambic pentameter, and that one talent which is death to hide, and that one talent which is death to hide. Ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. That iambic pentameter. Notice your end rhyme. Of course, you've got your 14 lines. No question, this is a sonnet, right? Notice the break. We've got those first eight lines that are going to set up the problem. Why haven't I done anything even though I'm going blind? Second part of the, uh, uh, the sonnet is the answer. Even, even people who stand and wait are serving God as long as they have the desire to produce. Let's jump to 3a. We asked this in the, uh, in the other Sonnet 7 discussion, but let's write it down again and ask some questions here. We already mentioned Longfellow's Psalm of Life, let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. Of course, Longfellow obviously knew you know, the sentiment very well as well. What is for you the one movie that most inspires you? That most inspires you to do something more? What is the psalm that for you most inspires you? When you begin to have self-doubt, when you begin to think that maybe you're a loser, a la Bilton, you listen to this song, and the lyrics of this song remind you, you got to keep going. You cannot quit. We think as well of that famous passage from Dante's Inferno. Dante traveling with Virgil, he's so stinking tired. He has seen too much. He has heard too much. He has smelled too much in hell. He's done. Dante the pilgrim is done. And he sits down and he says to the guide, Virgil, the great poet, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. And Virgil's response is the famous lines, up on your feet. This is no time to tire. The man who lies asleep will never wake in fame and his desire in all his life slip past him like a dream. Whoa, this is of course going to be lines that will be echoed in movies and in songs. What is it for you? What is the song for you that's the go-to? What is for you a book that you've read maybe? And all of a sudden, sometimes as seniors, it hits them from my middle school years on. Fascinating how many novels they had me read, how many stories and poems they had me read, which had this same sentiment. The idea is you got to keep going. You cannot quit. Whatever happens, don't stop. Of course, in our school, we even use Mr. Craig Conrad's idea of unstoppable. Whatever happens, do not quit. Do not give up. Why is this such an important idea? Let's jump to 3B. Let's jump to 3B. Why is it such an important idea to teach people, especially when they're young? Two things. One, you have talent. You have ability. Two, now go use it. Do something with it. Why is that such a big deal? Of course, back to 3A, we could go all the way back to, in English literature, Beowulf and the epic poem Beowulf. Remember, Beowulf says to Rothgar, I show up here to fight against Grendel because I have the talent to do it and it is my duty to do so. Which begs an obvious 3B question. One we ask, in fact, when we studied Beowulf, didn't we? If you have talent, do you have a duty to use that talent? To somehow better yourself and to better your community, to better your nation, to better your world? Do you have a responsibility to use the talents that you have? Or are you inclined to say, dude, that is way, way too much stress. Stop stressing me out all the time. I don't need to constantly be reminded I've got talent. One of my seniors once saying, the worst thing I ever heard in my life growing up were all of those teachers who kept saying in parent-teacher conferences how much potential I had. Dude, everyone has potential, the senior went on to say. Everyone has potential. It's the question of whether I care to try and use it or not. Why is it the case 
that some people really do care about using their talent. Do you think that's like the color of your eyes? Is it in your DNA? Or is it a function of maybe the people in your life who have challenged you, who have supported you, who have said, come on, hon, you can do this. You can do this. There's all kinds of fun stories about this type of thing. I'm always reminded of that one story of a student of mine who was a golfer and he was really good. And his father came to watch him play in a tournament. And he was doing terrible, my student. Terrible. Are you ready for this? He was dead last. And on the final hole, he had had enough. He could do nothing. And he walked off the green towards his dad and said, let's go. I am done. Take me home. And his dad looked at him and said, no, no, that's not fair. And the kid goes, oh, don't give me that crap about how it's not fair because I got all this talent and I'm not using my talent. And the dad goes, no, no, this isn't, I'm not talking about you. It's not fair to the competitors. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm the last one. It's got nothing to do with them. And this brilliantly wise father said, no, 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 you don't understand. If you walk off now and quit, some kid's going to have to go home. And when his mom asks him, or his dad asks him, how did you end up in the tournament? He's going to have to say, I was dead last. Because you're going to walk off. You cannot walk off because you will do a disservice to the one who is beating you right now. He at least can go home and say, well, I was a dead last. To which his mom or his dad will go, well, honey, that's something. Nice job. You leave right now. You remove that kid's ability to say, I wasn't dead last. You owe it to the kid who's beating you right now to go out there and continue to humiliate yourself and end up dead last. Go. And the kid telling me this story said, I, I had to go back out. He was right. He was absolutely right. He said, earlier in my career, I had been second to the last in a golf tournament. And I did go home and I was able to say to myself, well, at least I wasn't last. I at least beat one person. He said, I had to go back out there. What, a, what an interesting idea. You buy that argument? Or are you inclined to say, no, no, no. When you're having a hard go of it, you should just quit. See, some of us grew up in houses where we were told, honey, go out for the sport team, and if you don't like it, you can just walk away and quit. Others of us are like, dude, that was never spoken in our house. There was a mantra. If you go out, you will finish. I don't care how well you do, you will not quit. Interesting question. When you become a parent and you've got that little seventh grade son sitting there in tears and he hates playing the sport that he went out for, you let him quit midseason because he's had enough of it? Or do you say to him, we do not quit. Quitting is not an option. Hmm. Very interesting questions. Well, there you go. Sonnet 19, the genius of Milton. Of course, even more remarkable, he turns around and will write then blind. Paradise Lost. We'll get to that text next. Thank you.